Pick Up the Six is sponsored by Mudgear. Mudgear serves the unleashed with gear for the modern hybrid athlete that's made tougher. They've created strong, functional performance gear like their performance shirts, shorts, and socks. I wear Mudgear on the regular. Whether it's for a road race, an obstacle adventure, or a ruck, Mudgear can help you gear up for extreme performance. Go to mudgear.com, use the code PUT6, and save 15% off today. Amino Vital is on a mission to provide the highest quality amino acid-based nutritional products to all athletes aspiring to improve their conditioning and performance. They are a partner of our efforts here at Pick Up The Six, and I use their product before, during, and after workouts. They offer the purest and highest quality of amino acid products that help hydration and recovery. Check them out at amino-vital.com and use the code PUT6 to save 20% off today. I'm Brian Jodis. You're watching Pick Up The Six, and this is NGBN.TV. Attention, gentlemen of distinction. Introducing NGBN.TV, the television network designed exclusively for men in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. Your go-to destination for entertainment that speaks to you, inspires you, and celebrates the incredible journey of manhood. And here's the exciting news. NGBN.TV is coming to Roku, Apple TV, Amazon, and your favorite mobile devices. Whether you're a sports enthusiast, seeking self-improvement, or just looking for a good laugh, NGBN.TV has got you covered. Entertainment, inspiration, brotherhood. Coming soon to Roku, Apple TV, Amazon, and mobile devices. NGBN.TV, where men thrive. Hey guys, Brian Jodas, and welcome to Pick Up the Six. We've got a great conversation today coming up with Julia Watson Carlson. She was on the rifle team in the Marines, but she has some amazing experiences about what she learned doing women's engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan during the war on terror. And I can't wait to share this conversation with her. We talk a lot about her experience or coming up, how she got into the Marines, uh, making history uh, on the rifle team, but then really some indelible lessons uh, that she learned in working with women in a combat zone and, and the importance between those roles and the importance of femininity in those roles. And so I'm really excited to share that with you here in a few moments. Before that, well, I just want to tell you about this amazing experience that I had a few weeks ago, and I'm going to show you an incredible video that we put together. But if you've been following me on social media, at Brian Jodis or at Pick Up The Six on all those channels, but specifically on Instagram is a great place where we archive what we're doing. I got to spend four days in uh, early November leading up to Veterans Day in South Carolina. I was with my friend Lowell Coppert and a group of veterans. Lowell is a great friend of the show, former Green Beret, and he's become like a brother to me. And we got this idea of, of, of saying enough, of saying enough in, in the way in which some things have happened uh, for veterans in our country, the way in which far too many of our veterans are treated upon returning home, but also to let those who have worn our nation's uniform know that they are enough. Uh, and so we came up with this idea of let's get a group of special operators, elite veterans Let's get them to ruck across South Carolina with that message of enough, because we need to continue to draw awareness and attention to this issue. We need to keep picking up the six for these guys and gals who have done so much for us. So the premise was to join with this elite team. We bring the pick up the six production uh, might and gear and all that to South Carolina to follow along as these guys ruck over 170 miles from across the North Carolina, South Carolina border to Aiken, South Carolina for a big Veterans Day ceremony as well. So we built out this incredible team. It's Lowell. It's two other Green Berets, Rob Vaughn, Chris Cathers, two Navy SEALs, uh, Ray Cashcare, Ronnie Garcia, a Marine named Adam Cooper, and then two generals, Army General, Major General Tom Mulliken, and then Air Force Lieutenant General Ralph Jodas, my dad, uh, who's also been on the show multiple times. A lot of those guys have been. As well, and we've been very honored to have them be part of this growing pick up the six thing that we're doing here. But we launched into South Carolina. We did this amazing effort, and I was there to document every step of the way. And I want to share that with you now.
sure? All right, go. Yeah. Should we go up? Everybody here has got tabs and, and shiny stuff, badges and tridents and all that kind of cool stuff. So we've been there, we've done that. This is all about helping our brothers and sisters that are struggling right now. So we expected expected the mileage, the wear on the feet, that kind of stuff's all all not new to us. Carrying the ruck, not new. Veterans in our great nation have always led the way as um, they are people of purpose, and they continue that purpose after they've left the service. So even though they've taken off their uniform, they still continue to serve in the same capacity. They just are repurposed for a different mission. And they're willing to still go out there and help their fellow veterans because they know that it's going to make a difference. And they know that there's people out there that continue to need help. There's veterans that need help. There's veterans that will need help. They don't know it yet. Um, and we need to make them aware that it's okay to ask for help. Too many people um, are doing too little to help. So what we're doing is we're trying to support a great cause um, and doing it we're, we're creating pain on yourself, right? You know, the country's in a bad spot in a lot of ways, but there's still a lot of good people out there that still believe in this country. And you see it when you walk around with the flag on, you have people honking and waving. And uh, it, reminds me, it reminds you of uh, how great this country really is. I'm proud to introduce Lieutenant General Ralph Jodis. My call to action for all of you is to take these seven attributes, dedication, commitment, discipline, courage, there's loyalty, then there's fortitude, compassion. How can I take these attributes and turn them into action in my community, right? in my local area? Right? How do I go about and find a new purpose? a new mission that I can dedicate myself to. God bless all of our veterans, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you. Wow, what an, I mean, obviously just an incredible effort. Uh, I'm really proud of that one. Uh, proud of everything that we get to create with our partners and clients and friends that pick up the six productions. And if you want to team up with us on things like this or boy, anything you need in the media production space, we're able to accomplish a lot. Go to www.pickupthesix.com or just send me an email, brian 
at pick up the six. And we can talk about what that would look like. Really proud of that one. And, and what was neat was just to be there for every step of it, share that experience with my dad, which was incredible. We've got an archived uh, pick up the six podcast where uh, Lieutenant General Jodis Lowell Copper joined me to talk about that experience. We'll put the link uh, on the show page as well, or you can go check that out and you can hear our conversation about, it. but to be able to share that experience with him and then to be able to grab all that amazing footage with the drone stuff on the ground, be able to piece it together. I was really proud to be a part of it and to be able to share that with you. All right. We're going to talk to Julia Watson Carlson here in a moment, but let's take a quick break. This is NGBN TV, a network for men and home to top experts, speakers, authors, and more. Streaming TV for men, created by men. But why? Why are we a network that inspires? Educates, entertains, celebrates, and supports. Men in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, simply to save men's lives. There is an epidemic in our community. And it's taking men from us. I'm talking about mental health and suicide. But we have an answer, and it's streaming, live shows, sports, concerts, and more. In a real way for men to lock shields. We can't wait to launch this TV network for you and with you. 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 Join our movement at ngbn.tv coming January 2024. At a young age, Julia Watson realized she liked shooting. She was very good at it. She had a knack for it. And she would borrow her dad's shooting jacket. Well, she got into a competitive shooting contest and she needed some help. And Marines stepped in to help her in that moment. She was so taken aback. She wanted to be like them. She wanted people to view her like them. Thus, her journey to the Marines began and it would take her all over the world with deployments to Iraq in Afghanistan, where she would be involved in female engagement teams, and that would change her life. I'm Brian Jodis, and I'm excited to introduce you to Julia Watson Carlson. All right, welcome back to the show. Julia Watson Carlson joins me. Julia, great to have you. Thanks for uh, for coming on Pick Up the Six. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Tell me what's going on in Utah today. You're all the way out west, beautiful Utah. I got to guess it's a little cooler. You just got done helping paint a massive part of your mom's deck. So what's going yes. on in your world today? Yeah, we're t- I've taken a break. I still have one more coat to do, but I was helping my mom paint her deck. Yes. Uh, it's a, big fan- a, a, a break in the weather, so it's time yeah. to get the outside done. Yeah, as we record, it's early December. Uh, I'm sure it'll be on you guys weather-wise here soon. And then listen, big family, big Utah family. You're the second oldest of seven I think, uh, yeah, that's seven correct. siblings. So that's incredible. I know you and your brother were kind of working on uh, mom's house a little bit, but uh, but tight knit crew, huh? Growing up, I mean, was is that what it was yeah. like with a big well, crew like that? Well, when you grow up with chaos, you send you tend to be a tighter knit family. Mm-hmm. I I can tell you this that all of my siblings, we are best friends, and sometimes you don't hear that with your when you hear about people's brothers and sisters, but my siblings are just very we're all very close even if we live far away that's that's an incredible blessing to have you know my brothers and i are incredibly close we fought a lot as boys growing up and it's just the way it was but yeah. those two need anything in a moment right spring into action and do that you've got good proximity to a lot of folks out that way you talked about growing up in the chaos i tend to run a little hot a little loud audience knows that from getting to know me okay let's go <laughs> well no my point of it is you have a real calming presence. When I first talked to you on the phone last week, I, w- I was having a uh, a flustered bit of a week, just a lot happening, a lot, a lot of moving parts and pick up the six, these incredible efforts that we've been doing with NGBN TV, all good things, but I was running hot that day. I, I left our phone call feeling a sense of peace. So I think our audience will maybe take that with them today. Oh, well, thanks. I didn't know I had that capability. I will, I'll, Talk to people more often then. <laughs> when you're when you're staring down a rifle with a uh, rifle trophy championship on the line, uh, I would assume that having that kind of peace is important. Obviously, we'll talk more about Julie's background and how she got there. You, you grew up, I, I think the story goes, you borrowed your father's shooting jacket 
you got into some shooting competition. You got introduced to to rifle riflemen, marksmanship, right? Shooting activities, which then introduced you to the Marines, and you're like, I want to be a part of that. So, do you mind taking us back, Julia Watson, to those days and sure and what that was so like? I I was always hunting with my father, and um, we went to a, a a little hunter safety course, and the the range safety guy said, you know what, she's got some pretty tight groups here for never shot before you should get her into competition. So my dad found me a coach and, and I started competing and then I would just been borrowing my dad's shooting jacket. Now, back then when you're shooting high power, it was with the M14. So it's a 762. And as a young kid to have the right gear was mm-hmm. very helpful. So I had gone to the national championships after saving up money to buy a shooting jacket only to find out that the the check that had been written to pay for my uh, entry fees had bounced or something, something went wrong. And the Marine Corps team found out that there was a junior shooter from Utah that did not have a shooting coat. And they bought me, they pulled up their NRA points and it went to purchase a shooting jacket for me. So I was able to compete that year with a jacket that fit me. Now, this was in 1993, and this was the year that the Marine Corps team had won everything at the Nationals. So I remember sitting there in the audience in awe of them taking care of me. First of all, they took care of their their junior shooters, even if they didn't know me. And then here they were displaying their exceptional talent as marksmen and, and going up on stage. And I remember sitting there. And having the conscious thought of, I want someone to see me the way I see them. Mm. And so that's what prompted me to join the Marine Corps. One one of the reasons. I also wanted to serve my country and be a part of something bigger. But that was the catalyst. Julie, did you go right in after high school? What was that journey like to get there? And then was the realization when you got there, this was the right move? What were those moments like? (sighs) Well, I enlisted in the delayed entry program in my senior year of high school. Mm-hmm. And so I, I did go right in after high school. And of, of course, there's a, the shock of, okay, what did I get myself into during your initial training? But once I got to my unit and I had experiences in boot camp that did confirm to me that I made the right decision. And there was, there was markers like that along my 22-year career that did also confirm that 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 the path I took as a young child, because, you know, just a young teen, we're still kids back then, that that it was the right decision. What was your uh, MOS assignment, right? Because obviously you're very skilled with the rifle. I've got to assume, all right, that's going to mean I'm going to be part of the Marine Corps shooting team, but then you <laughs> also have to have other jobs in the service, right? So what were you doing in those early days? Correct. So there was no guarantee that I was going to get a a spot on the team. It was a series of <clears throat> tryouts and um and and whatnot. But I initially enlisted as a heavy equipment mechanic and engineer equipment. And that's what I started doing my first couple of years in the Marine Corps. But in the meantime, I pestered my marksmanship training unit and my floor sergeant at the time to let me go shoot. Now here's a funny story. And this leads to just the word of opportunity Mm because most Marines and most soldiers and, and service members do not get the opportunity to have as much trigger time as I was able to get. So the story goes is I bet my floor Sergeant that if he allowed me to go shoot this division to shoot an intramural championship, which is what led up to the division matches, that if I won the rifle, that he would allow me to go to the next level higher. And he didn't believe in me. And I told him, I'm going to win. I just, I just, let's make a bet that if I win, you let me go. So I came back with the trophy in hand for winning this intramural championships with the rifle. And I remember when I walked into the compound, now this is a salty Marine. He always had a coffee cup in his hand and a cigarette in his mouth. And when I walked in, I remember the cigarette kind of just dangled because he just, <laughs> his jaw dropped. Right. But he he followed through. Mm. He allowed me to go to the next level. I placed there 
which moved me on to the last level before I got selected. And if he hadn't allowed me that opportunity, I would have never made it to the act, the, the big team and then gone full circle from when I had seen those exact, some of those same Marines on stage. Now they were my shooting partners to go to the nationals just a few years later. Yeah. That, well, I mean, it's incredible opportunity. It's also sort of, boy, well, he held to his word, right? He, yes. He, he could have, oh, you know, I well, you know, could have jammed you up if you really yeah, wanted Yeah, we to. need you here in the shop, right. you know. So there, there are untapped talent out there mm. that if you were going to give them the opportunity to excel, you know, as leaders, we've got to allow people to have the opportunity, especially if they're motivated. And mm. I was just hungry to reach that initial goal of mine was to make it onto that team. Yeah. We got to be looking as leaders for the folks that we can get up to that 80%, right? As we lead up and train up, can I get somebody to 80%? Can I step out of the way and let them right. take it and go from there? Oftentimes, it's sometimes it's easier. I'll just take care. I'll just do it. But but think about that opportunity that could be missed. By those out well, there, and, whether you're mentoring right, and, or and I will forever be grateful for that sergeant that allowed me to go and do that. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. So that's sort of uh early mid nineties. Obviously, sure. the world changes forever six, seven years later, and your life in the Marine Corps, like many others in the United States military, shifts pretty rapidly as now we're facing real wartime efforts, deployments, and all that. How do you weave in competitive shooting and then that time frame, knowing deployments are coming, right? What does that look like for you in those sort of early to mid 2000s? Well, um, I had gone back to the fleet after three years on the, the rifle team and started back into being a maintenance chief at this point. Um, then I ended up um, having a kid and then I transferred to the Marine Corps Reserve and then started teaching and competing as well with them on the marksmanship side. So a lot of training, a lot of helping units get out the door with um, better, better skills to protect themselves and others with, with their, with their sidearm and their, and the rifle. So that's what I did for a few years. And what, are you still there? Yep. You're good. Had a, yep. had a blip. All good. <laughs> so, so I ended up um, joining a, a unit that was deploying. Now, keep in mind, I at this point, I had become, my name was recognized in a lot of circles through the record setting things that I had done in, in on the shooting team. So um, first female to win championships, um, uh, some national records as well, not just women's records, but overall. And that the reason why I'm saying that I don't like to toot my own horn on the marksmanship side, but because of those accolades and the character that I tried to develop with myself, because here I am, you know, we're an, we're an ambassador when we go out to the range, yeah. whether it's civilian or other military. So a lot of people look to our character, not just with our skill. So when I joined the civil affairs group, to deploy to Iraq, that was one of the things that allowed me to go out and do some of the things that I've done. And the opportunity then uh, came out, I had initially, let me back up a little bit, with the civil affairs group, our focus is civil affairs, it's stability operations, governance, economic development, reconstruction, healthcare, whatever the, the local area needs to get back on its feet during wartime. And it's it's not a new thing. It started in Vietnam with the combined action platoons. So anybody that's looking at trying to learn the benefits of civil affairs, the, the history is there. And it's pretty cool to mm -hmm. go and read about what those combined action platoons did. So I was there with civil affairs as a public affairs officer 
So I was just going to write positive articles about what our Marines were doing and our sailors and whatnot in, in Iraq. And we had teams, our civil affairs teams were all over Al Anbar province. I went out with one of my teams in Ramadi to do a story about what they were working on the area. What happened was, is it was very comedic. I'm in this room, all of the local women had been ushered into the other room and the men started talking with each other. The women started peeking around the door and kind of waving at me, come in here. So I said, well, I've got security outside. I'm gonna go see what these women have to talk about. And they ended up, we had a great conversation, but it was unprecedented that in the fact that I didn't end up writing an article about what the men were talking about. I wrote a point paper, a white letter, if you will, to our commanding general of the map at the time saying, you know, here's what I found out. And it was actionable items about what the insurgency were doing that the information that our coalition forces did not have at the time, which they ended up doing um, a, a raid, if you will. They did an, a, a mission um, to take care of what these women had disclosed to me. So the white letter basically talked about if we're not able to talk to half the population how to, as civil affairs, how do we know if we're implementing the right plans and programs in the area? Because at the time, we were trying to win hearts and minds. And if our next, if our focus is on the next generation before they go insurgency, mm -hmm. how do we know if we're getting all the information? And I just left it at that. But I remember on the way back from the chow hall one day, the, the DCG of the MEF saw my name tape and he's like, I read your letter. I want you to tell me how we do this. Like basically, I, I, sir. I'll go figure it out. So that's what started the Iraqi Women's Engagement Program and where we would go and try and meet with the women, understand the actual needs, the problems in their area. And it wasn't just, here's some soap. Let me teach you how to wash your hands. Here's some, we weren't handing out stuff. We actually created um, an IO campaign with a magazine and it was all translated with all sorts of information of, what we can do to help bolster the government. So it was, wasn't just our information, it was the government's information. And there was a lot of other things that we did, but the, I guess the crux of it is, is it opened my eyes to a way to help both sides mm. to understand myself as, and, and be more grateful for what I have Instead of, you know, when you come back here, you see all the shopping and the stuff and our problems are not nearly yeah. as bad as we think yeah. they are sometimes. So it gives it gave me a lot of perspective as for the gratitude I have for our nation, for the servicemen and women that I work with. I mean, you can start listing all of the different markers of gratitude that I began to have, but it also gave me the perspective of how important men and women are and their character on the battlefield. How much do you think we underestimate um, or take for granted what we have here versus what those women have to endure through on a daily? I mean, you got to see it firsthand. But there's a reason that they peeked around the corner and called you in there to be able to have that kind of conversation. Yeah. Um, so they saw me as a benevolent presence because of my gender. Now, it's hard to, I had shorter hair back then, but my red hair was just very, it, it would peek through under my Kevlar. Just, you could tell I was a female. And because of that feminine presence, they saw me as a different gender. I wasn't necessarily seen as a combatant I was there in their eyes there to help and that's what prompted the initial conversation they were asking for medicine and I said well what's wrong you know I'm not a doctor I'm not going to just diagnose and they said well I've got a heart problem I can't go to the hospital because the insurgents are in the hospital they're only taking care of themselves 
So that's how we found out that the Ramadi General Hospital had been overrun by insurgents. So now the local people couldn't even go to their own doctors. And that's when they did um, a raid on the hospital. And that was information that we didn't have. Yeah, that's right. So as far as the gratitude and what the difference is, it's, it's huge. I think we get so distracted because of things you know, we're, we, we over, um, we need to simplify our lives mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. you know, activities, we have all these extra things in our life, whether we, lo it's, we love things. It's, a, I mean, I, I, for sure. And there's, and I'm not saying there's something wrong with that, but if, if you're focusing on things, then you lose track of people mm. and you lose track of yourself. In my, in my opinion, you start to lose your identity because you're so focused on all these, the things. And I'm, I say things as in the activities as well, things to do. Like, oh, what did you do on the weekend? Well, if you go out and you're always saying, I'm going to do this on this weekend, I'm going to go and that's when, when's your rest period? When do you right. get to sit back and heal and reflect? Cause we're always constantly going. Yeah. There's, there's a lot important there. I want to unpack a little bit more of it. Deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, right? Yes. In Talk. Afghanistan, I did more uh, civil affairs and more on the female engagement yeah. side as I, well. I want to hear about similarities, but then unique differences between those two countries and cultures. Okay. So some of the similarities, you've got the tribal aspects, right? Where you've got the family groups and, and, and supposedly they're tight knit and you have the inner tribal um, conflict as well. Um, education was the, the lower aspect of education for women. What were some similarities as well, but there was a big gap with the comprehension of for both men and women in between Afghanistan and Iraq. So there was a hydroelectric well that we were installing in one of the areas in, in Afghanistan and the local people nearly became an uproar because they believed what they called the dynamo was stealing their water and it hadn't been hooked up yet, but that's, the, the, the lack of understanding of that this hydroelectric will is going to provide electricity for their, their area. Um, the other thing that I noticed is in, in Iraq, and, and I, I'm not saying that I'm an expert by any means on this, but this is with the families that I met with and some of the people that I worked with, these were the things that I noticed. In Iraq, you had the, the women in the tribes, they would be uh, more trustworthy of intertribal women and within their own family. In Afghanistan, the women I met with, they wouldn't even trust their very own sister. So it was really hard to, because one of, um, it was really hard to connect women to work together in, in Afghanistan because of the lack of trust. They're just, there were there was so much fear and so much oppression that they didn't know that that was an option. Whereas in mm -hmm. Iraq, when we started working with some of the women, one of the concepts that we started talking to them about is doing what they could do as a group of women within their cultural um, umbrella that made sense to reach their goals. One of their goals in Iraq was they wanted um, security for the schools and jobs for women. Um, and they wanted certain safety things within their, their area. And so on their own, they decided once a week, um, they were going to meet as individual tribes of women to come up and see what problems they could resolve. And then once a month, they were going to meet as a, a group or a region of women to then bring, you know, this is, we're talking about inner tribes between the three tribes in this one area that had a history of fighting, they decided to work together. 
the women did after we had gone in and there and worked with them. And then the feedback that we're getting from the male team leaders with the civil and the um, religious leaders in the area that the women were now putting kind of lighting a fire on the men, on their male leaders to address the problems that they couldn't address on their own as women. And it actually sparked in this area, al Qaim was the first area to run out all of the surgeons. And it's what started that, what you know historians call the al Anbar awakening. We didn't um, promote in the media all the things that we did with the Iraqi women's engagement program in this area. But you have to wonder, when you look back at the timeline of what started the al Anbar awakening, when it started in al Qaim, within a few months after these women starting to connect and organize themselves and then work with their government and their religious leaders, you've got to wonder if the term, if mom's not happy, no one's happy, mm-hmm. fits. But that concept did not work at all in Afghanistan. What worked in Afghanistan to help the women was to help the men. Mm. If the men were on board and allowed it, it can happen for the women. In one area, I worked with the district governor there to get a girls teacher. And at first he said, no, this, it can't happen. It can't happen. I said, no, it can happen. I, and I, I bolstered him up. I said, you're amazing. You have the capability. You've got contacts in Lashkar Gah. You are this powerful, strong man. You are fully capable of getting a woman's teacher. And he sat back and he said, you're right. I am powerful. I am capable. I can do this. Sometimes you have to be reminded. And, and this is what I saw in Iraq and Afghanistan. You got to give them the permission. They have to be reminded that they're capable of doing something. And be reminded that they can do something good. And he went and got a girl's teacher for me. Those are incredible anyway. stories. Yeah, no, it's incredible to hear There's, about that level of work. Yeah. Because, you know, part of me is very concerned. And look, I'm, you guys have prefaced this every time. I'm a guy sort of on the outside looking in with enough inside knowledge and enough friends and loved ones in the space. To, to be close enough to say, I'm, I get very concerned that all that incredible work, when when evil forces rise back up again and call it Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hezbollah, Hamas, whatever you want to call it. Whatever the new term is. Whatever yeah. the term is, that's where they go first. To, to, to You take that, that progress away and it's much easier to, to flip, right? It's got to be much easier to flip young insurgents if the women are removed from the, from the conversation. Oh, they, right. Because they got eyes on their kids coming up. Yeah. Well, I fully agree, agree. So there's a couple of things here that I think about when you're when you're talking about that. Is one the the their history. You know, how do I put this? TV, music, radio. You know, we don't repeat. You know, unless we study it we're doomed to repeat our history because we have so much else that distracts us from remembering. Mm. So I had gone to one area briefly and I'd sung a song to these kids while I was on patrol, not loud, just enough for them to hear what I was saying. They'd run back in, they'd tell their moms, there's this girl out there, she's singing this song that in, in our language and it pacifies the area. Now, the only reason why I'm telling you this because Four months later, I'm back in the same area. This little kid sees me and he starts singing the song. He remembered me. These people are going to remember everything that we do and don't do. They're going to remember because of the way they pass down history. Mm. So they're going to remember the positive things as well as, you know, so when we're saying, okay, what do we do when the, insurgents come back in and they lose their all their freedoms again some part of them has a remembrance of what it felt like to have that little bit of freedom whether it was being able that little girl that was able to go to school for a couple of years she will have that 
or whether it was the women that started working together and started trusting each other, they will have that. But the big thing is, and this is why nations are fall, in, in my opinion, with what I studied when I came back, because I really wanted to understand more about why the women's engagement program itself and why nations are struggling with this. There's a, a BYU professor that created what's called women and womenstats.org. And if you go in there, there's a list of all the markers of um, these key factors around the world regarding women. Now, whether they have access to health care, whether they can vote, whether mm -hmm. they feel safe and secure. So all these key things, right? Um, the statistics show that the women who have low marks on all of these things that are our society, our free, the free world takes advantage of most of the time. Those are the, the governments with the least mm. stability and it correlates directly. So women that have a horrible lives, you got to think about the fact that when those start going down, their whole society is going to start going down. And that's the trend. And she's been, the, the, these studies have been out there for decades now. And I'm sure you can go back and look at the, the downfalls of society because of the women. Now, I'm not saying that the women are more important than men. I'm saying that if you reduce the women and their rights and their freedoms, it's going to affect families. And it's going to affect generations. And then the men will not have their ability to succeed and be the people they need to be. Yeah. You I well, you're what I'm hearing is you need to appreciate and understand the importance of both in the ways oh, yeah. in which we should be celebrating, advocating for all of those. But there are differences. There are massive differences. I'll just flat out say it. We are blurring the lines in far too many cases. My concern, again, I'm a guy on the outside looking in who has people on the inside that just loved ones. My concern is you blur the lines between male and female roles in the military. I think there could be real problems. I just, I'll just flat out, I think that could be an issue. And I think, I if you right. And if you blur the line between men and women in our families, there's going to be even probably bigger problems as well. So, and that's a heavy topic and maybe that's just a longer topic for another day that we talk about, but there is something yeah. in it. What, what I get the sense is that you go into the Marines uh, to be an expert marksman and to serve your country, you get these incredible experiences of real engagement and life yeah. down range. And it feels to me like it changed you in a big way. And those are probably all these values that you had in there, but it probably unlocked sort of your purpose, it seems like in life to go deeper into these areas. I, I learned to love people, even if they were ready to kill me. <laughs> mm. So I, you know just, what you gotta think about Julia. There's so much context to that. There's so much context that we don't know. And when you can connect with someone on a human level, a lot of that stuff can kind of fade. Those differences can fade away. Right. I told you guys, calming presence. Told you, right? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> How much of that um, did you take with you, right? Post-military career, the endeavors you wanted to do from then on. I mean, how much of that do you carry with you, those experiences? Well, I, I actually carry all of it. Um, I, sometimes I, I think about things that I've done or I'm in the middle of doing something or I smell a smell or I hear a song. You know, there's a lot of reminders of what I've done and it does change. It just, it, it's changed the trajectory of my life. You know, I, I'm not exempt from hard things, divorce, um, trauma, uh, other things that have gone on because of the military. Um, and then after trying to assimilate back into the civilian life, even as a reservist, I still was so active on 
going on orders so often, it wasn't quite like I was a reservist. So yeah, we talk a lot on this platform, on our extended family of shows at NGBN about mental health, men's mental health, but also really being able to address right everyone in our lives for you. This, I didn't tell you this ahead of time, so it's sort of putting you on the spot a little bit, but okay. your keys, right? right For you, when you're right, I know what Brian needs to sort of be in his best mental health as he can be. It's always, there's always work to be done, right? I need to get up early. I need to get yep. a workout in. I need to be grateful. Talk to the creator early in the day. Like those are things that set me up for the best chance of success. What What works for you? Forgiveness and compassion for yourself. And a life long commitment to service because when you serve other people you can't help but feel good when you stop serving other people and when you stop forgiving yourself that's when you forget who you are and i think that's the crux of a lot of the problems in the world is when we lose our identity and we forget who we are we lose our way what i'm saying is our intrinsic value, that we are sons and daughters of God, that we are all brothers and sisters. And if you forget that relationship that you have, that you can talk to God at any time, and that his arms are always stretched out, no matter how far you think you've fallen or how depressed you are, that you find a way back to, to remembering who you are and where you came from. Beautiful. Hey, before we go, how often do you get to shoot now, right? Stay sharp. What do you like to do in um, that space? I I just, I go to as many matches as I financially can. <laughs> so um, it's a little bit colder right now, but I, I'll travel to Arizona and California to go shoot. And then I, I did hang up the gun for about seven years. And then I came back um, this, these last two years and started shooting again. And it's, I guess it's for me, it's like riding a bike. I'm mm. learning the optics. I, yeah. So I used to just do shoot iron sights out. Shooting iron sights, yards. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A thousand yards. But yeah. now with the advancements in technology, I mean, you can probably like, look at this. I can just dial this thing right in. I know. So my eyes are older, so it's actually a benefit. <laughs> To, to, yeah. to have that optic. Yeah. Well, but I could I'll, talk, I could anyway. talk to you all day. I could <laughs> talk to you all day. I could, uh, I'd love to maybe do more. You know, I think there's just, there's important things for our audience to think about as it pertains to sort of those roles you talked about. And then I think just the way in which you distribute your energy and think about that gratitude, thankfulness, something important in there about compassion and forgiveness to yourself. God, we're so Very hard good. on ourselves, man. We're so it's I know because I we forget. It's I because know. you forget who you are and your value. If you understood your value and what you can bring to this world, despite all the darkness that keeps wanting to encroach all the day long, the, the enemy of our soul, if you will, wants you to forget who you are. And if you don't listen to that voice and you have compassion on yourself and forgiveness, imagine the men and women and what we can accomplish just remember who you are amazing she's julia watson carlson i'm brian jodas we'll be right back thanks so much for joining us we're so excited about what we're doing here at pick up the six and what we're doing through our extended network at ngbn Dot TV. We have so much more to come and we're excited to have you be a part of this journey with us. Go to ngbn.tv, look up, pick up the six there and check out all the other great shows and content creators that we have in this streaming TV network for men in their forties, fifties, and sixties. We are just getting started and we love to have you with us along the way. I'll see you next time. Pick Up the Six is sponsored by Mudgear. Mudgear serves the unleashed with gear for the modern hybrid athlete that's made tougher. They've created strong, functional performance gear like their performance shirts, shorts, and socks. I wear mud gear on the regular. Whether it's for a road race, an obstacle adventure, or a ruck, mud gear can help you gear up for extreme performance. Go to mudgear.com, use the code PUT6, 
and save 15% off today. Amino Vital is on a mission to provide the highest quality amino acid-based nutritional products to all athletes aspiring to improve their conditioning and performance. They are a partner of our efforts here at Pick Up The Six, and I use their product before, during, and after workouts. They offer the purest and highest quality of amino acid products that help hydration and recovery. Check them out at amino-vital.com and use the code PUT6 to save 20% off today. 